I see we have a quorum in the house and a quorum now almost seated. <laughs> well, welcome everybody to the September 9th, uh, 2015 uh, monthly meeting of the Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments. Uh, we do like to begin with some introductions around the table here. So, uh, Commissioner Heise, would you get us started? Dennis Heise, El Paso County Commissioner. Rob McDonald, PPACG. Gerald Blaine, El Paso County Commissioner. Mark Dwell, <laughs> Park County Commissioner. I'm back. Welcome back. <laughs> We've missed you, Mark. The sequel. Thanks. It's good to be back. I'm uh, Rich Birchfield, representing Colonel Doug Schess from Peterson Air Force Base. Tony Masteler, representing Deanna Berg from Shriver Air Force Base. Morning, Brad McDonald, uh, representing uh, Colonel Troy Dunn from the Air Force Academy. I'm Rod Chisholm, Deputy Garrison Commander, Fort Carson. Hello, I'm Mike Silverstein with the Air Quality Control Commission. I'm representing Chris Colt Glazier. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Nolan Schreiner, a newly appointed uh, Transportation Commissioner. Bill Murray, City Council, Colorado Springs. Tyler Stevens, Green Mountain Falls. Norm Steen, Teller County Commissioner. And I'm Mark Snyder, the Mayor of Manitou Springs, and I'll just keep talking until these ladies have a chance to sit down and introduce myself. <laughs> Where are you, attorney? Women in black are here. We That's can right. begin. <laughs> Commissioner, Park. Everybody looks really nice today. I, was there some? Must be a nice luncheon at the Broadway. <laughs> <laughs> Brunch, you know, for you, Mark. Which restaurant? Oh, it's just for me. It's well, just for you, you, Mark. It's much appreciated. <laughs> and Sharon. And Sharon Thompson, Fountain City Council. Thank you. Welcome, Sharon. Thank you. So we have a quorum. We've done introductions, and we have an agenda approval item. Uh, Rob, any changes to the agenda today? None that we're aware of. Does anybody have anything they'd like to add? Okay. Or amend to the agenda? If not, then maybe a motion concerning the agenda approval be in order. Move to approve. Second. Any discussion? And all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Thank you. So item three is public comment. Uh, and we have 3A is a welcome to Joe Urban, the AAA director for Pikes Peak Area County Governments. He is at our... Murderer's Row. Of oh, staff. there you go. Oh, yes. Joe's <laughs> in the back. So uh, pleased to welcome Joe uh, as the AAA director. Uh, he's been in the industry for a long time. Uh, currently sits on Commission on Aging for the state. Uh, remains there. I don't know when. Their meetings aren't today, so you can be next here week. next week. Uh, so we're looking forward to a great transition that he had with Guy and looking forward for uh, the new evolution under Joe's watch. I so wanted to make sure you all got to see him, and he'll be at the podium, not today, but soon enough. Well, he's got some tough shoes to fill for, with Guy, but I know he's more than capable and uh, worked with your wife for many years over in D14. So uh, welcome to the family here. Thank you. And then item 3B is topics not on the current agenda. Would anybody in the public like to speak to the board about something that's not on today's agenda? Now would be the opportune time. <laughs> I don't see or hear anybody, so then I guess we can just move right on to Section 4, the consent items. We have two items today, the minutes and the financial report. Does anybody wish to pull any of those for particular consideration? If not, then uh, perhaps uh, a motion concerning the consent items? Move approval. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Thank you. So item five is reports, and uh, we, we like to lead off with both CDOT and our military installations. We have CDOT listed here as a, a first report. I'm not really seeing any CDOT folks in the audience today. I and thought Nolan had the report today. <laughs> well, I, I, there we go. Was it? Okay. Couldn't Mark, quite see you back Mark, there. Mark Andrews. Mark Andrews with CDOT. Um, the, we don't have an update from what we presented last month. So from what we presented last month in terms of projects, um, that's our, our update. In terms of construction projects, we do have uh, very little progress to report in terms of construction based on last month. We still have uh, the Fillmore project. 
underway, Cimarron underway, um, and then we've got uh, the old ranch project underway with, with various other projects. So things are going well. Uh, so next month, if the board would like, we can do a, an update on uh, additional projects. Mr. Mayor, Please. question? Sure. Maintenance. You're currently working down on the south end of Highway 85, kind of through uh, Fountain. Um, I believe we approved money to do some work there, and then on a little further north, more in the B Street intersection area. Are, it hasn't gone quickly on the Fountain no project. <laughs> it looks like it's going to be a nice project when it's done. Do we still plan on getting up to the B Street area? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so this, this cycle or this construction yes. season. Okay. So yeah, it, that Schmidt construction, it is a two-piece project. One on the south end, one on the north end, and uh, you know, like a lot of our projects, we're behind because of the rain, so we got a late start. Right. Um, but that one is moving along nicely uh, with the good weather, so we're anticipating to be able to catch up. Um, it should go fairly quickly this September, so I can bring an update next month to the board. But I think I think by then we'll probably have about 70, 80 percent of it done by then. Great. I I assured the Stratmore Hills residents they had not been forgotten that there was you were still going to try to make it, and I wanted to confirm that uh, I had given the right report. Yeah. So so yeah, that project's anticipated to be completed this year. Okay, thank you. All right. I have a, a quick question, too, on the Rainbow Falls Bridge Rehabilitation. Sure. I know that bid came in higher, and we were rebidding it this fall. Can you give us an update on that one? Sure. It's, it's going to go out this fall. Um, we're, we're probably a couple weeks away from bidding it. We moved the ad date back a couple weeks, but uh, it's going to go out the end of this, this month okay. for bid. Okay. Get an update maybe next month on that also? Yes. Great. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Andrews? How's the time? Thanks, Mark. Well, it's my pleasure. Actually, we, he introduced himself already, but after a, an exhaustive process and, uh, and a lot of fine candidates, we're pleased to announce Nolan Schreiner as our new C.2 District, uh, District 2 representative on the uh, Transportation Commission. And I don't know if you wanted to tell us a little bit about yourself or what brought you to this exalted position, but uh, we'd love to hear from you. Well, I think most of you probably know me, but uh, I've been around for a long time. Moved here in 1968. I worked for the city and the planning department for 10 years, then I started my own consulting firm. And uh, NES is the name of the firm, and we designed numerous projects like Briargate and Mountain Shadows. And, a uh, number of projects around town. I retired five years ago, and since then I've been hopefully giving back and volunteering for numerous boards, and this one came up, and I'm very inter interested in the transportation, especially in the at the state level, and so I'm anxious to get started, which is next week. Yes, it is. Well, we're really glad to have you, and I know that some of us got to meet with you last week and start giving you the a little bit of information and uh, we're here to help you in your job there also so we really appreciate you coming out today isn't it a law in El Paso County that no project can be done without NES's involvement well we have been involved with a lot of projects <laughs> <laughs> well welcome again so we're glad to have you all right so with no further CDOT information to convey then we can jump on to 5B the military installations report and I'll let you gentlemen figure out who wants to lead off so uh, from Peterson Air Force Base on behalf of Colonel Chess uh, just a reminder that on the 17th of September he has his state of the wing address it will be over at the club from 3 to 4 3 to 5 and then uh, for a group of folks uh, who uh, have been participating in the community partner community partnership initiative we have a charter signing and we've been reaching out to those folks individually and they represent just a swath across the city and we really appreciate all the involvement you know from the commissioners to the city council uh, to the hospitals to the UCCS uh, Pikes Peak Community College uh, the Aviation Authority so we've got uh, just a, a great showing of spirit of the intent of how we're all trying to work together sharing resources uh, for the betterment across the whole 
uh, city. So we'll be doing that charter signing ahead of time and then going to the State of the Wing. And that's it from Pete for now. Great. Tony. So uh, good morning on behalf of uh, Colonel Burt, um, Deanna Burt out at Schriever. Uh, again, appreciate being here. Uh, busy month in August, a couple of really fun activities, opportunities for our airmen, uh, opportunities to partner with Ellicott School District, uh, uh, Slide the City, set up a, a unique opportunity for us out at Shriver Air Force Base and had great participation from the Ellicott, uh, busing in over 100 kids to participate in that. Um, and then followed up a week and a half later with Diversity Day, where at Shriver we celebrate, <clears throat> rather than breaking up uh, throughout the calendar year, various you know, rec opportunities to recognize various cultures and ethnicities. Uh, we pack it all into one diversity day where we have booths set up and again invited Ellicott School District to participate and, and uh, showed up and uh, supported those opportunities for the kids uh, to see and be exposed to different cultures and, and diverse populations. So uh, continued partnership with Ellicott and, and uh, really, really happy about that. Good morning. Uh, from the Air Force Academy, uh, I guess the overarching state we, we make it almost every month is we just love the community and uh, just so appreciative of uh, what Colorado Springs and entities such as this do uh, for all the military installations. And so as we look over the last month, we appreciate the ability to coordinate on the joint land use study and the scope of that. Um, uh, Rob, to, to you, personal thanks from the team at the Academy for how you've helped uh, integrate the, us into that discussion. So thank you. Um, uh, other parts, uh, we've had uh, an opportunity to have some uh, uh, distinguished visitors up to the academy, including uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so thank you for coming up there, and uh, I'm, I'm sorry your golf game wasn't as uh, good as you hoped. But uh, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> hey, don't hold on, you. <laughs> it's a tough course, and, and it sounded like your that teammates drug you down. So, so uh, but thank you for being there. Oh. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> boom, <laughs> that one boom goes the dynamite. Um, and uh, also, uh, as we continue with uh, encroachment-related items, uh, I was just talking with Commissioner Glenn before we started, and he was talking about uh, some of the conversations that he had had with the local community here in just the last month about noise and so we appreciate folks coming out and understanding and, and then carrying out the message so we want to be good partners in that regard um, parents weekend just happened you probably saw a whole bunch of uh, cadets uh, across the board and so between them and their parents I think they spent a lot of money in the community and uh, so uh, thank you for being a great host for that uh, football uh, the poor cadets had to do uh, you know the equivalent of 63 points of um, <laughs> Of, uh, we scored 63 uh, to 7. That's how bad we beat Morgan State. So, yeah, so the uh, cadets are recovering from that. Uh, next game is this Saturday. We host uh, San Jose State, 8:15, and there's fireworks at halftime. So, I uh, just want to share that. And uh, thanks again for letting us be here. And I apologize about the golf thing. Well, well you know, I got to tell you, even though we have great respect for our military guys, I'm not <laughs> sure when they're when they're posting net 51s. You know, that, that, that's kind of tough to compete with. <laughs> but that was a wonderful event, and I had no idea what I was missing out on by not uh, attending more functions on our various military installations. So that is uh, something I finally have seen the light on. I might be seeing more of me. Well, thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Uh, good morning, and again, thanks for having uh, all of the installations invited to participate here. Uh, at Fort Carson, it's a busy month right now, just and it is for all of our defense installations because we're going through our year end. So our financial management people, our contracting people, and and particularly the engineer communities at our installations are pretty busy trying to finalize contracts. So we're kind of hunkered down, looking inward right now. But there are some big events coming up, and and there is a lot going on with the. Uh, uh, and the engagement in the community with encroachment, as was already mentioned, and what we're trying to do with the uh, init partnership initiative, and, and uh, there's a front-range uh, encroachment management team meeting among the installations, which will work very closely as the JLUS uh, continues on, Rob. It's just a great thing to see the whole community gel on encroachment uh, as it's defined here for the Pikes Peak region. But this Friday, uh, a lot of folks in here receive invitations to go to the 9-11 memorial ceremony that will be hosted. At Fort Carson this year, and it's going to start very, uh, uh, very distinctly at 10:30 Friday morning at Gate One, just at Gate One there, where we have sort of a museum and a memorial park, uh, which is you don't have to get access into the installation to attend uh, that function, but that's going to be at 10:30 on Friday morning, and 
looking forward to General Gonzalez is TDY right now, but he's traveling back to be here for that ceremony. And so uh, that'll be a big event for uh, some of the key leaders in the community on this Friday. Uh, apart from that, I did mention in detail some of the things on Army restructuring last uh, meeting, but uh, just to reemphasize, Fort Carson did extremely well in the latest announcements of uh, reductions for the Department of the Army. Uh, we uh, were only 365 uh, authorizations of active duty soldiers going down. Some places were losing as much as 5,000 as the Army's moving down to a total strength of only 450,000 soldiers authorized on active duty. So Fort Carson's holding its own, and, uh, and, we, and a lot of that, as I mentioned last, uh, last month, is uh, we're recognized for the strong partnership we have in the community and the bonds that we have, and so we're looked at a, as a healthy, uh, relevant installation. So that's all I have. Well, thank you. Dr. Nall? I just... Uh, when you get old, chronologically gifted, you uh, <laughs> you think about key things that have happened, uh, uh, not only in your personal life but in public. And uh, I came here. No, may I don't think I came until yesterday. But 1970, uh, we were told I was on city council, and we were told about the installations plan to be implemented and growing, adding air force with army and so forth. It was fantastic. They talked about the huge financial impact that was going to happen. But we also talked about the military leadership <laughs> and their volunteer <laughs> participation, a long tradition of it, uh, on the civilian side. And uh, I must say, from my perspective, it went well beyond the contribution we even dreamed of at the time. And it was a marriage that had only happened a few places across the country. And it was the only one, due to the mountain and everything else, that had the various branches all there. I used to wish that we had some. We did have some kind of naval station here for a while, I think. And I wonder how they could. Submarine base, was it? <laughs> <laughs> you didn't know I was that old, did you? But anyway, we, I just want to uh, publicly thank the military again for. Uh, their history of service in the public uh, sector. The only way we could have afforded uh, a bright compliment to our community uh, without that. And uh, I would thank you for the years of participation between the military and Colorado Springs. Well, I have just a comment on the Navy base there. When I was in Cheyenne Mountain, uh, some of you may not realize, but there's a nice pool of water in there with a little boat on it. That's how I drew my CPA. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Jim, you, you raise a great point, too, because I think it might have been Andy or Norm last week was telling me that, you know, the ski industry has an annual economic effect in Colorado of about one, one and a half billion dollars which is roughly the same impact that our military installations have in Colorado. And yet at a state level, they seem to be so focused on the I-70 corridor, getting people up and down the mountain 20 minutes quicker. And yet here we have these wonderful military installations. So I know we, I, I'm really proud of the work we've done as a region in supporting our, our military. And I'm hoping maybe we can uh, be a leader on the state level in, in getting the state to recognize the equal impact uh, that the military uh, presence has in Colorado to that of the ski industry. So I don't know if that was you who was telling me that or you, Norm, but somebody. I remember we talked about it, but I don't yeah. remember who it was. Yeah. yeah. Joint conversations. Joint. <laughs> and, and, and <laughs> Colonel McDonald, I did have a quick question for you, one I get from some of my Manitou constituents and other trail users. But they're wondering how we're close we're getting to maybe having some access back to some of the trails uh, on the west side of the academy grounds. Yes, sir. Yeah. So talking about the Santa Fe Trail? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, so we've uh, had multiple conversations with uh, community leaders, and in fact, we had an opportunity to have uh, Commissioner Glenn and uh, Commissioner Littleton up uh, maybe about a week and a half or two weeks ago. And so I think we're uh, moving towards in the new term a, a community and base solution that allows us to maintain safety and security um, in a long term fashion. Good. Well, thank you. So, so no, no time uh, estimates yet, but you're working towards uh, some kind of a compromised, balanced solution there, huh? 
Yes, sir. Yeah, and I really, we really appreciate the help from the commissioners because that, that piece of it helps us to understand the community pieces that are coming in as you're receiving, Mr. Mayor, so that we make sure when we open it back up that we're considering the concerns of the community as well as trying to make sure, especially as we're in force protection condition Bravo, how to make sure that we maintain the safety and security. But we're, we're moving forward and continuing the dialogue. Thank you. We're looking for volunteers from Manitou to help monitor the trail. <laughs> you know, I can bring some volunteers up there. <laughs> we build a lot of trails in our little part of the county. So. On trail this week. <laughs> what about helping him with his golf game? <laughs> work on golf game is fine. I just, uh, <laughs> it's my foot wedge that isn't quite up to speed yet with some of the uh, competitors up there. You know? I remember Ooh. something in the paper about Ben that couldn't be helped. It was some note on his oh. golf ability. But no. Next Hopelessly next addicted, next I'm afraid. <laughs> Does anybody have any other questions for any of our military representatives? Now would be a great time. And I'd also like to welcome everybody's favorite councilwoman, Jill, Jill Gabler, and Andy <laughs> Pico, who just joined us a little after introduction. So. Okay, so we can jump right to Rob's executive director report. Great. Uh, and again, uh, for the joint land use study, uh, great feedback on the scope of services budget. Uh, from the installations and some of the community partners. Uh, don't have an announcement just yet, but before your next meeting, we'll have an official announcement. Uh, they like to go through federal channels, and so uh, I think we're, we've crossed all the T's out of the I's. Everyone agrees uh, with scope and budget, but stay tuned. I'll email out to the board once we have a, a final commitment on uh, Office of Economic Adjustments part to send the money our way. Uh, so. How that gets here, we don't know, but there'll be a signing of sorts. Uh, the other report uh, is in your packet. Uh, one thing, uh, Joe's still here. Uh, in the report, it talks about hiring two new folks for Joe. Uh, we have uh, two, uh, one, uh, Lucy Jacobs, uh, going to be one of our volunteer <coughs> coordinators. So she may uh, pop in the room now and again. Um, and also uh, Barbara Sigmund. Uh, she walked by but didn't take a seat. Uh, she's going to, uh, she will be working uh, as a case manager. So when folks call and need assistance connecting the dots uh, to services, uh, she's uh, one of the other positions that the board approved in our mid-year budget uh, approval. So good to have them on board. So Joe now has some assistance, and he won't have to do those tasks. Uh, also, uh, some of you have heard that our, our, our website was uh, uh, hacked uh, a while ago, and you didn't have access last month. Uh, but thanks to some great efforts from Rachel and... Uh, I thought a few, and who else was helping you with that? I know uh, Erica's here in the audience, uh, but a few just really helped out. Uh, our servers weren't really touched, but other servers were. So uh, they took all our websites down uh, across the board just to make sure. So we uh, rebuilt them, uh, updated them, in, is in process. So stay tuned for that. But it's working now, I hope. At least I see a lot, en enough devices that haven't been put away uh, that uh, our website is back and working. So a public thanks to the staff and uh, for patience of everyone who tried to get to our website. Uh, it's hard to have it go down in the middle of a long-range plan. Uh, so they hacked us and Ashley Madison at the same time, huh? Yeah. They, so. uh, is that what it was called? <laughs> mixed both the mailing lists. <laughs> uh, yeah. um, is that what happened? <laughs> so they, yeah. Uh, so hopefully they'll – yeah, they, they, they were posting some tobacco ads, I think it was. So nothing real serious, but – we don't sell tobacco products. So I think uh, we got that squared away, and uh, we have a system in place that shouldn't happen again. Uh, but stay tuned for, for the updates. Uh, the other thing I uh, talked about, uh, uh, the, the impact, not Impact 64, but Impact, the, the, fe the federal uh, group that a lot of you are part of. Uh, talking to them about transportation priorities, and on your agenda we're going to talk about that, so I'm not going to talk too long about that. Uh, some of us are going on to the trip to D.C., uh, to talk about that and a few other things. So um, I'm going to join that trip and talk about transportation, aging issues, and probably military issues as well since we're out there. Uh, so I've got three hats to wear on that one. Uh, so that's coming up at the end of this month. And I'll leave it at that. The rest of the report is there. Great. Thank you. Any questions? No questions? Sure. So some of us will also be attending that trip. I, I would love to see what your itinerary is for, for D.C. so that we can see how we could... Uh, come along with you or work with you on that? Oh, yeah. I'm joining the itinerary of the impact group 
I just may have a side trip or two, but I'll let we folks We can see know. that as your board? Mm -hmm. Great. We'll all crash into the Pentagon. Question over That's here. a poor choice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> crash your meeting? No. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Caro. Please. Uh, Caro, uh, what was the broadband discussions? Yeah, uh, Colorado Association of Regional Organizations. Uh, all my counterparts around the state. Uh, most, some of the most of the rural areas uh, are trying to get broadband connected, and so it's not a big deal in the metro areas. But some of the rural areas, they're trying to figure out how do they best do that, using uh, connections through uh, state facilities, perhaps, perhaps CDOT, perhaps other state agencies have buildings and Wi-Fi and other things. So they're trying to figure that out. Uh, there's some money through Department of Local Affairs to do that, so uh, just report on that, but not too much of an issue in the, our metro area. Thank you. How long is your tenure as chair? Uh, running two years plus until I can convince someone else to chair. <laughs> you guys meet quarterly? Uh, about twice a year. Okay. Any other questions for Rob? Thank you, Rob. So we can move right on to the TAC, Transportation Advisory Committee. I see Jennifer working her way up. Good morning, Mr. Chair, Board of Directors, Jennifer Irvin, El Paso County, but for the purposes of today, the TAC Advisory Committee Chair. Um, we had a good meeting in August, and um, we our first item, our recommendation to you is in regards to the 2040 Moving Forward Regional Transportation Plan. Uh, we reviewed the chapters that were available, and there were a few t to still be uh, completed, uh, but we recognize that we still have the ability to make comments during the, the the period and as they go to as they before they came to you as well, so um, the TAC will it has recommended a release of that to the public for the 30-day public comment period. Um, the second item was uh, the presentation of the regional transit and specialized transportation plans, and Ms. V Mr. Vitulli and Ms. Bond did an excellent job presenting um, the comments that they received. And we are recommending approval of those plans. Um, the next item was the 2017 to 2022 TIP project scoring. We did make a recommendation to you as the board. Um, I see that that's not on your agenda today. Um, but we did make some recommendations for some changes to be incorporated to accommodate some of those um, uh, priority plans that were in identified in the non-motorized, um, so it's some bonus scoring. So I think that uh, is good use of the plan that was developed and approved by the board. Um, item number six is the um, 2016 to 2019 TIP program, amendment number three, and that was subsequently broken into two um, TIP amendments for the CAC and for the board today. And so we recommended both those projects that are in those amendments. And then um, we also discussed at our meeting the Regional Transportation Priority Project List. This was an item that we had requested staff to put on in July on our August agenda for discussion. And I anticipate that we will come back in August with a recommendation to the board. Um, you see in our list we started to discuss some of those projects and some of those uh, priority roads. And so we'll be making a recommendation to you next month. And then um, we also discussed the additional projects that um, were identified as projects that needed additional funding um, that we've been, kind of been tracking. Those are projects that were not included in this last TIP amendment, but were some of the older projects. And we had been asked by staff to kind of hold on to those projects until they came to the, um, until we finished the, the last TIP amendment. And so, um, uh, we were asked by staff to go ahead and submit those projects, and I anticipate those will be coming to the TAC next month and then the board ne next month for recommendation for approval for additional projects. These are some of the old projects that have been um, underfunded as a result of some of the uh, inflationary increases in the area and the construction costs. And our next meeting is September 17th. Okay, thank you. Any questions for our TAC chair? I have a question for you, and Certainly. it's more in your role with the county, but since we don't have you on the further agenda. <coughs> so I take it you guys had quite a uh, learning curve on repaving the West Side Avenue project. Um, 
project that kind of got started and then delayed because of, I guess, a public hue and cry about the end of summer and, and blocking all that. And, and really, my, my point is, is that, you know, we really appreciate the county taking the lead and being proactive in doing that. Andre called me maybe a month ago. Anything special in Manitou this fall that we should be aware of? And I talked about the Commonwealth Arts Festival and the coffin races. But I have to admit, I had not contemplated such an early start to that project. And I think if, if, if maybe you guys had reached out a little to Manitou, maybe even Colorado Springs a little more, we probably could have uh, avoided some of that for you by vehemently protesting a end of summer major paving project on our main access through the west side there. So um, I would just like to again please contact our public works director, City of Colorado Springs early on these decisions. And I think we always get a better product when we work in that fashion. So that's all I, I would agree and I thank you for those comments and we will continue to uh, work towards uh, more and better regional coordination as we do those projects. Um, I think that sometimes there's no good time to pave, um, especially with the tourist business in the area. So I, I think that's a good thing to think of as we move forward, especially for the um, uh, the, the construction of the full project of and, and make sure that we continue to coordinate on that. So thank you. Thank you. So now we'll hear from our community advisory. Good morning, Bob Baker. You know, Mark, it's hard to fathom a more serious insult to you that can be <laughs> levied for taking personal responsibility for your own golf game. I mean, I it's just, it's terrible. Oh. <laughs> uh, reporting on our previous meeting of the CAC, we reviewed, discussed, and recommend the 2040 Specialized trans, uh, Transportation and Transit Plans, the uh, release of the draft of the Moving Forward 2040 Regional Transportation Plan, and uh, the Amendment Number 3 uh, for, of the TIP. Uh, there were questions regarding the priority status of the project uh, that were raised and uh, regarding the local funds that were provided for that uh, TIP amendment number three. Uh, there was a voicing that this project might have been approved administratively were the policy level raised to uh, a, higher, a higher level. Uh, in fact, there was some discussion about that. I don't know whether that is possible, but uh, maybe a number of projects could be uh, processed administratively. We then heard the reasoning for the administrative modification to place TIP Amendment Number 4 on both the TIP and STIP to provide uh, post haste uh, with the Charter Oak Ranch Road project. Uh, there was agreement with the action. Uh, Non-action items. Uh, we discussed uh, a revised regional transportation project priority list and the backfilling of projects that are funding short for reasons of inflationary cost pressures uh, to be included in the 2016-2019 TIP, uh, all in the context of not one penny extra policy. Uh, prior to our meeting, we conducted a one and a half hour uh, workshop concerning project scoring and weighting using uh, the pairwise comparison methodology, which in, certainly enhances one's focus on the end product, which is the weighting of criteria. And it, uh, uh, Craig, how did the results go? Um, we haven't got, gotten all the uh, rankings yet, but the pairwise comparisons about as expected. That's, it, it's class. really a good exercise. It, uh, it takes, it pits one criteria against all the other criteria. There were 78 possible combinations and uh, it makes you then narrow down the, uh, the weighting of, you may have three favorites in there, but there's probably two of them that voted against uh, one and you, you go on down through 78 combinations of, of 
of comparison. So uh, maybe the board should go through that, Craig, you think? I've got that pencil in for next month, actually. Uh, so, uh, sounds like an, a wonderful exercise. <laughs> yes. Uh, <clears throat> we, uh, we finished with Vince Rusinak, uh, a member of the CAC, uh, giving a presentation on some research he's, that he's done regarding community feedback uh, that occurs in Arizona, in Phoenix. And it's called uh, the Town Hall. They've been doing it for a number of years. And it's, he's coming from the direction of expanding the input on things that are going on in our community. Now the problem is, uh, as I see it, uh, is uh, where would the domicile be for this kind of activity? Uh, how would you staff it and how would you resource it? So there's a, a couple of people on the CAC that are looking into this and uh, it's, uh, I guess we were, we're mainly concerned <laughs> and those of you in politics probably have a great appreciation for this, is the lack of substantive uh, input on issues that are in front of you. And, and in other words, when you have a sizable project and there are seven people that attend a meeting and make comment, that's got to be somewhat frustrating. And so what they're talking about is a way of uh, increasing that input. So we'll keep you informed. Any questions? More a comment. When you get like 700 comments. And they're all negative? Well, <laughs> well, well <laughs> all if you're trying to sort through all of them, you'll be looking back to the good old days when only seven came out. Yeah. <laughs> Could be. I don't know. I, we, I found that the more we involve the public, the better end product we get, even though it can be tortuous at times to read through 700 comments or what have you. But you know, I still think our greatest resource are, are the voters and the taxpayers in this region who you know, have pretty good common sense. And uh, I, I just continually find that we benefit from the, any, input, any additional input we can get. So. I'm pretty enamored with the idea. I'm not sure where it should be housed. Colorado Springs is, you know, such a big entity. It might be the most effective home for something like that. But uh, I don't want to put Rob on the hook, but we, we have some experience with that. I know Transit has done e-town halls before and uh, for a lot of their public process. So maybe there's something we could build off of there. Well, as I said again, uh, resourcing it is probably the major problem. Andy. Excuse yeah, uh, Colorado Street. We've actually done e town hall several times. Yeah, it, it works pretty well. Uh, you you get a pretty good uh, increase in input. Absolutely true. But we have done it. Uh, yeah, that's what I was yeah. thinking. I yeah. seem to all that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions for Mr. Baker? Uh, it's the <laughs> last Tuesday. Fourth Tuesday. Last Tuesday. Rachel. Wednesday. Wednesday. Last Wednesday, yes, in September. Last Wednesday in September. We have July 29th, 2015. Uh, well, that's, I'm reporting on our August 1, oh, no. too, August 26th, I believe. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. So we can move on to the Regional Advisory Council, the RAC. There's Joanne. Hi. Good morning to all of you. Thank you for this opportunity. It's always a pleasure to come. Glad to meet you as well. Um, we, our last meeting was a, a rather momentous one for us as we transitioned our leadership. We had a, a nice little send off for Guy and we welcome Joe. And Joe, thank you for coming and joining our group. We really are happy to have the, the opportunity to extend our um, Interaction with a larger group of people always, I, ad I, I really agree with you. The larger input we have, the better the product that we can offer. And I was particularly thinking about the military families as you all were offering your 
uh, really fine report that you have many retired people here and you also have parents who have come to live near their children. You, re you are children, of course. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was a shock, wasn't it? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> But um, I, 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 would like, I would like for you to think about how can, this, how can our um, area agency on aging better serve the retiree population or the parents of you who are children of aging parents in our community. So I, I, that's a totally off the cuff thought, but this is the place to present that. So please think about that uh, and let us know what we can do. Joe's sitting back there eager to hear as are all of the RAC members. Um, we had a, a real fine demonstration of what the community input can do as we looked at, <clears throat> excuse me, our YMCA uh, has now taken over the lead and the responsibility of our senior center here in Colorado Springs. If you want to see what an active population does to, to guide and uh, present a, a really thorough information sessions of what is needed by a population. If any of you had an opportunity to be at those senior meetings at the senior center as the YMC, as that discussion was happening, it was a very vital conversation and it made a huge difference in how that program is being offered in our community. I think it's going to be fine. It's going to be a real advantage to all of us. So if you have ideas, let's, now's the time because everything is blossoming in the senior resource uh, that community asset that we have. So please, make your thoughts, your community thoughts known. Um, and, and other things, Lisa Allridge offered a very uh, good summary of our, of our fiscal year 2015. Uh, Guy offered, as you have in your notes, a nice um, review of what has happened of, as he closed out his term of leadership. And um, we will have a, um, we had a, a nice community reception for Guy in the afternoon of the thir on that Thursday. And now we're looking forward to next month. Our meeting is um, Thursday, September 24th, our next RAC meeting. If you have any public input, please come and share those thoughts with us. We would appreciate it. Are there any questions? Not a question, but a comment. I wanted to praise you and everybody for the way that uh, the YMCA transition has taken over, has taken root over at the Senior Center, because there was a lot of concern on the front end, and I thought it was really wise to kind of slow things down a little bit and, and gather as much of that input, and, and to every person I know that had concerns are, are very pleased right now. So Good. I'm glad to have that feedback. Thank you. Thank you. We were very pleased and impressed with the presentation to us by the YMCA and Jody Barker, who is now the proper title is director of senior, I'm sorry, I don't have that title, <laughs> but he has a fine title. <laughs> That's what matters, but most of all what matters is are the relationships that he and the staff of the senior center and the volunteers of the senior center have created in this community. We are to be envied by the nation, believe me. So thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Iraq? No? no. Thanks. So now we can move on to the Mobility Coordinating Committee. Hello. Hello. Good morning, Chair and Director Board. Um, out of respect for time, as always, I'm going to highlight um, our two uh, major action items. We did introduce Mr. Joe Urban. Uh, he was announced as the new AAA director replacing Guy. And then the MCC members unanimous, unanimously recommended that the Board of Director approve the 2040 Regional Transit and Specialized Transportation Plans. And you have the notes before you. Any questions? Uh, my only question is, every time we get a Bustang report, it's, it's, we get the one point out that, you know, oh, the Glenwood Springs route is doing wonderfully. But we don't get much more information. Um, absolutely. We have, and I believe it was included in your packet. Mistake me if I'm wrong. We can send it to you that showed the uh, routes by location, the average daily rides, and statistics. If not, we can present that to you. I don't recall 
call that one. So. It's, uh, it's starting out a little slow, but um, they did highlight the major change that with the 44%. And it looks like we're a little below on the south route and the north route. And the west route is uh, far exceeding what they've expected so far at the initial stages. Okay. Thank you. Any questions? Please, Dr. Nall. Do we uh, still get reports on ridership and uh, uh, bus stops and so forth on the, as part of public transportation? Yes, and also the mmtransit.com website, uh, you can get the dashboard reports as well. That's it. If there's Thank any you further for your questions, time. Thank you. And finally, uh, under reports, we have the Arkansas Fountain Coalition for Urban River Evaluation, AVCURE, as we like to call it. Hello, Rich. Thanks, Mark. Um, at the uh, after meeting, we uh, discussed different approaches to resegmentation. This has been an ongoing uh, discussion of the group. Uh, has been having in uh, pre preparation for the regulatory hearing um, and the data the, that we might use to go ahead and, uh, and resegment the, the streams into, um, into different bins. Looked at uh, using ge geomorphology, hydrology, land use, um, collecting data from the, the different entities to uh, go ahead and use and create those uh, bin or um, resegmentation of those stream segments. <clears throat> we also, the other um, item we spent a lot of time on was we reviewed the list of water quality impaired stream segments that the state came out with. And a, uh, a group of us um, have been looking into the data. We requested the data from the state and we've been finding uh, lots of errors um, uh, in, in the uh, state's methodology and um, uh, they actually didn't use some of the USGS uh, t data that's available. So we've been working with the state in, uh, in trying to uh, co clarify and um, uh, straighten that out. Um, so that's been an, an ongoing item to uh, go ahead and uh, make sure that they're, that they're using the correct data and make sure they're, they're uh, c comparing the data to uh, the, the correct standards. Um, that's pretty much the uh, two main items that we talked about. Any questions? Thanks. Before we, we jump onto the action items, uh, Mike over at uh, Air Quality, we don't really have you as a standing report, but I always want to give you or your co representative the opportunity to fill us in on anything that might be going on with the commission or uh, anything you wanted to report. Well, very good. Thank you for the opportunity. Again, I'm Mike Silverstein with the Air Quality Control Commission. And uh, although my sign says Chris Cole Clasier, uh, Chris t has been attending these meetings for the past few months, but he couldn't attend today. And so I, uh, I volunteered to uh, take his place uh, for this time. I know that, uh, that Rich presented an update on um, kind of the, the pending air quality issues at your last meeting related to uh, uh, the promulgation of a revised ozone standard from EPA, the clean power plan that's, um, that's out there. So uh, there haven't been, um, you know, dramatic developments um, to speak of. The state will be kicking off a stakeholder process uh, on the clean power plan to, um, as it begins to develop its initial plan that is due about a year from now to EPA on uh, its, its, its it's a projection of what a, a statewide plan would look like. It's not the final plan that has to be developed in a year, but it's an initial plan that gives a, a framework for what a future plan would look like. So the state um, air, air pollution control division will be conducting stakeholder meetings throughout the next six, eight months, I would imagine. And the first one is um, scheduled for September 25th. There's a webcast. There's, um, the meeting will be held in Denver. But the, uh, it'll be on webcast, email comments uh, can be accepted, and, and in-person comments as well. Uh, EPA is set to uh, promulgate uh, a revised ozone standard um, probably within a month or two. 
and uh, it's anyone's guess is what the standard will be. There's uh, there's pools all over the place. Years. Yes, right. So <laughs> EPA under, under court order has has got to issue a plan. Um, they've had numerous um, uh, decisions against them for failing to uh, update the uh, the uh, the standard for the health based standard. Uh, bets are 70 parts per billion that uh, might come out from EPA, but the, that uh, proposal is with uh, OMB now for review. That's usually the final stage of any uh, regulatory plan um, that would come out from EPA. That's the Office of Management and Budget at, uh, at, in Washington. And so um, we're anticipating an, a revised standard, and then uh, about a three-year process would then um, be undertaken to develop a, an updated ozone plan for the state. It looks like if, if the values are, if the standard is set at 70, the Colorado Springs area, according to the monitoring data we have at this point, would not be a non-attainment area. So that would be great news for the, for the region. Although the, the area does have a history of exceeding 70 on a regular basis. So depending on meteorology and emissions in the region as we move into the future, we, this area could fall into non-attainment. But at this point, looking at the data we have for the most recent three-year period, uh, the, the monitors in this area are below that 70. Now, if the standard is set at uh, 68 or 65, then the area would be non-attainment. So we'll have to just wait and see what EPA does with the standard and how the monitors uh, measure ozone in this region. So the state stakeholder process, it's going to be exclusively in Denver? Is there any talk of going around the state and holding some? There will be. There will be uh, meetings likely throughout the state to gather public input, um, industry input, uh, all stakeholders. Uh, you know, have a voice in this process, and I believe the Air Pollution Control Division is planning on holding meetings in other parts of the state, and I definitely will relay that uh, back to the office that at least one meeting should be held in Colorado Springs that was gonna, or the Pikes Peak region. Yes. Sure. It seems like everybody has an opinion on our little downtown power plant. <laughs> There's a lot of information just flying around, and it would be nice to kind of get that a little more, everybody on the same page, right? dealing with the same facts and figures anyway. You may have a thought on that, Mr. Chair of the Utilities Board. I don't know. but <laughs> I think we would appreciate having, having uh, something down here. I also want to acknowledge uh, I asked for a certain amount of research there uh, from, from the um, Air Quality Commission up there, and, and thank you very much for the information that you provided. It was exactly what I was looking for. Oh, very good. Glad to accommodate. And one other development uh, related to your, um, your power plant here, the Drake facility. Um, the Air Commission held a public uh, meeting, uh, let, I don't know which month am I in? It's in, in August, a few weeks back, regarding another standard, uh, a health-based standard for sulfur dioxide. And uh, the Air Quality Control Commission agreed with staff that the Pikes Peak region should be classified as unclassifiable for sulfur dioxide versus non-attainment, which some were arguing for based on um, a number of studies in the recent past. So the Air Quality Control Commission approved what's called an unclassifiable designation for the SO2 standard. It's a very tough, stringent standard for sulfur dioxide, um, but it's, it's a conditional approval. The conditions were that some additional technical analysis be performed here in the region to see what that uh, power plant's impact is on the local community for sulfur dioxide. The utility is installing a meteorological tower at the site to, um, to get on-site uh, weather conditions, meteorological conditions, so that that further research can be done properly. And then a decision would be made one, two, three years from now as to what the final classification should be for um, that standard and this power plant. And the Drake power plant isn't being signal singled out. All large power plants across the country that emit significant amount of sulfur dioxide fall under this requirement and all have to do similar studies to see if they do comply with the standard or, or they don't. And so it's, it's a step two of about a four-step process that EPA is, is requiring the states to undertake over the next 10 years to determine if that and other power plants um, cause high levels of SO2, sulfur dioxide, in the, 
the close by community. Thank you. Excellent report. I'm glad okay. we took the time to hear about it. Well, very good. Thank you for the opportunity. Anybody have any questions, Mr. Silverstein? So we can jump on to Section 6, the action items. And 6A is the 2040 Specialized Transportation and Transit. Hello. Good morning, Board of Directors. I'm Angel Bond, Mobility Manager for the Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments. And Brian Vitoli and I are coming before you today to ask that you approve the um, transit and specialized transportation plans that you guys have seen before. Um, and as you heard this morning, we have went before the CAC, TAC, and the MCC, and they have all recommended that you approve it as well. And this culminates uh, over a one-year-long Planned development process with a very extensive public outreach effort and a very diverse stakeholder participation group, which included uh, school districts, human service providers, um, city council members, and county commissioners, and uh, fountain representation. So it's it's a very very good joint process that the city conducted with PPACG, and uh, we believe we have a very fine product. Well, you're unanimous. Uh, Recommendations from all the uh, stakeholders here and, and reviewing committees. So that speaks well of the process. And the public comments that we received are included in your packet. Um, that's all of them? Yes, and I believe that's because we did do such an, uh, since we did do such an extensive, robust outreach process, because we did do a community mobility review that had um, focus groups, one on one interviews, stakeholder. Um, engagement and then also our steering committee we were really intentional with that and we wanted to include as many um, transit dependent and transportation dependent populations or at least people who represent those populations in the planning process so I think that the only six comments probably is a testament to the fact that we did incorporate everybody's opinion prior to well, I think we all recognize still those of us that have aspirations that we can you know, start becoming more of a choice rider type of uh, approach. And uh, so I, I, what I see is good work here, but I, I don't want to set the sight of that aspiration. Today we can actually have a transit-centric district with good headways and a transit-oriented development will follow and you know, it could really be the beginning of something great for our community. So, so. Agreed. Questions or comments? A motion perhaps would be in order concerning the specialized uh, transit. Move approval. Second. Discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Aye, Savic. Congratulations. Thanks. <laughs> I see Craig working his way up to the. Uh, Dias there, so we'll go ahead and call item 6B, the draft moving forward 2040 regional transportation plan. Good morning. After three years of process and, <laughs> <laughs> and 15 other prior approvals that the board has, ha, has gone through, we're now ready to go back out to the public and make sure that our total 15 chapter plan is, reflects what we've heard in these three years. Uh, we're, uh, the CAC, TAC, and staff all recommend release of the plan for 30-day public, public approval. We'll go through the process, bring it back to the committees, and hopefully in November bring it back to you for approval. If we do receive significant comments that require some you know, major adjustments, we actually have until January to uh, approve. Okay. But uh, 15 previous uh, approvals, so we, we're pretty confident that we're, we're, we're where we're supposed to be now. And all the chapters are? Uh, all 15 chapters are on the web. On the web. And I know the board members have all been digging into those every oh, evening. It's just a wonderful way to exciting uh, reading. transition to sleep. <laughs> but, but, uh, <laughs> please, Joe. So, Craig, is the only way that people can access it through the Internet? Are there any meetings or? Yeah, we'll be having uh, uh, at least two, possibly three outreach meetings. There's uh, Saturday the 26th. Uh, at uh, the Hillside Center, and then there's a, a meeting at Ivy Wild, and there may be an additional meeting here. And how are those being advertised? Can uh, you... Our typical out in the papers, 
um, advertising on the web. Okay. It's our can, standard. Can we get that too? So if we yep. can send it out. Okay. Thank totally. You. Great. Any other questions or comments? Mm -hmm. Motions? To approve the um, draft moving forward 2040 regional transportation plan for, for public. Second. Comment. Any further discussion? And all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. Thank you very much. Finally, under action items, we have 6C, fiscal year 2016 through 19, transportation improvement program number three. This one's for action, and number four is for information. Uh, good morning, Scott Phillips, PPACG. Um, the amendment number three uh, is being presented to you today. It's a uh, uh, El Paso County uh, project uh, at I-25 in Northgate. Uh, it's a Str the Struthers Water Quality Project. Um, the funding received notice uh, by the county earlier this month. Uh, the funding is uh, a million dollars uh, grant from CDOT. It's a new program. It's been, I believe, uh, around for the last year. So it's e excellent. It's an extra million dollars coming to the region. Uh, and it's being matched with El Paso County, uh, local dollars of $1.15 million. It's been rec uh, recommended by both the CAC and the STAC, or CAC and the TAC, and also staff. And we're here to request your uh, approval for the amendment and uh, to add it to the tip. Great. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Phillips? <coughs> Comments? Anybody willing to move on this item? Chairman, I move to approve uh, the tip by amendment number three. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Thank you. Sure. So that does bring us to Section 7, Information Items, and 7A is Fiscal Year 2016 through 19, TIP Amendment Number 4. Not going anywhere, huh? No, nope, still here. Yeah. Uh, lots more excitement for you. Uh, this is also, uh, this originally was part of uh, Amendment Number 3 at the TAC meeting. Uh, it was recommended by both uh, FHWA and CDOT that this item be moved as a uh, to an administrative modification amendment. Uh, th this is a project that I know that's been on the table for a while. There's been there have been other actions uh, to get this this road portion of road uh, incorporated into the MPO boundaries. Uh, that's been approved, and with that, uh, moving forward to add this project into the tip. It's a Tiger grant of 1.2 million dollars with a $300,000 match with, by the county. Uh, PPAC G board has uh, provided the authority to the transportation director to make approvals for administrative modifications, which this is. Uh, that's been done uh, by our transportation director, uh, Craig Casper, and it's been moved forward. This is being presented to you as information item only, and the action's been taken. Well, it's, a, it's really good to see such collaboration here between the locals and CDOT on getting some of these vital projects done, and specifically ones that benefit our military installations. Sure. So it's been a, a real stated goal of ours for a while. It's good to see it uh, coming to fruition in many different ways. Great. Thank you. Any questions before we lose, Scott? Thank you. And then item 7B is list of priority projects on state highways. Uh, traditionally, good, good afternoon, or good morning again, it's not afternoon yet. Traditionally, concurrent with the adoption of the long-range plan, the board adopts a list of priority projects that uh, reflect um, the projects most in need of funding. Uh, looking at the current list, most of those projects are either done or their need has been pushed, pu pushed out into the future years. So we're going through a process with the advisory committees, and we've talked to CDOT a couple of times to come up with uh, the priority project list. What we're uh, suggesting this time is two priority project lists. One, that is some manipulation of existing funds, so the projects would be in the fiscally constrained plan, and one that would be for uh, new money if there's some sort of new taxes, so that it would include the fiscally constrained projects also, but also allow 
projects that are not in the fiscal constraint plan to come into the priority project list. Uh, the you know, attachments to the memo show some of the information that will help inform uh, development of those lists. Uh, are there any questions? We're aiming for about 300 to 500 million dollars per list. Um, so. So how would you start these two lists? Do you think staff would take the first stab at we've, it? We've, uh, we've actually met with CDOT and uh, using the scores of the plan and some of the additional analyses we've done, we'd come up with a, a, take a stab at a couple lists, a straw dog to kick around and uh, um, see what comes out of it, the meeting. So, You know, it is pretty impressive to look back at the, this original list and realize that, you know, did the vast majority did that. of them are. Did that. Did that. Yeah, yep. You know, and that, and that really was, I think, a watershed moment for this organization when we were able to kind of come together as a region and set those regional priorities. Yep. And it really has made a, a big difference for us, I think. So yep. it's a good and process. And one of the things that's going to be interesting is we had the previous list was projects that were really big projects that were really, I won't say obvious, but you know, yeah. the needs were definitely there. We're getting, we, as we've knocked some of those off, the, we're getting into some of the projects where it's going to be a little tougher to, I think, come up with a, a list. There's so. Victim of our own success. So exactly. Speak. Please. Craig, um, I'm not sure how we start, start this conversation, but uh, what we need to be looking at in the future is the addition of six laning, I see is the proper term, uh, from probably exit 120. <coughs> What is, uh, what's gate 20 down there? 130, anyway, 132. 132. 132, uh, up to circle. Used to be when you had congestion there, you would find out why with the red and blue lights. Now there's just congestion, congestion. there uh, every single morning. And, and I realize that's not going to be the number one priority, but if we don't get it on the list, It'll never be a priority. So that's, how, do, how do we make that happen? The see that that's actually one of them. See that when I met with them last week, that was one of the projects. I think it was their second one uh, that they put on that. So good to hear. Yep. So. No, that's right. So I confess to maybe not understanding this completely, but um, when when you are beginning these conversations about priorities, are you just looking at congestion, or are we considering, again, you know? how I can think of things as um, long-term solutions as far as uh, maybe multimodal and transit. Is that considered in these priorities or is it just this is where the worst traffic is so we need to lay some lay some lanes? We, we start out using the scores from our long range plan which takes into account um, it's not just congestion but safety, multimodal, transportation, infill is actually goes in there so the all, all 13 goals. And so we'll start with those scores, and then we did a, some additional analyses, the benefit-cost analysis uh, that you see is attached of the road projects, just the road right. projects. Right, I saw um, that. And uh, use that to help also add information. Um, in talking with CDOT, one of their other priority projects they mentioned was uh, just a, sort of a blanket region-wide uh, operations, looking at putting fiber up to Woodland Park, um, the on-ramp, um, signals, I forget, I'm drawing a blank right now. Um, also been mentioned is a region-wide non-motorized project that doesn't really, you know, no, mm -hmm. you know, we need to figure out the needs, you know, $15 million or something non-motorized across the board. So, so as you're talking to CDOT, are you sensing in, any shift in, in their priorities along these kinds of issues? It's not just congestion? Um, well, definitely safety is, is safety and maintenance are, are I would say CDOT's higher priorities over congestion. And what does that I'll mean? Speak for what do you mean by safety and maintenance? Uh, crashes and getting like I-25 South. There's a, a section of I-25 that has the um, a lot of rutting and looking at some sort of white topping, some sort of rigid pavement. But Mark, if you want to. Sure. I think the question was multimodal. More than anything, are you looking at multimodal options? Well, other long-term solutions to congestion and sure, not just... Sure, sure. So, absolutely. I mean, we are... It's kind of a mind shift at CDOT where we're looking at operations first. Uh, ramp metering, for example, is a great opportunity to, to improve congestion, uh, improve travel time reliability without necessarily increasing the number of lanes. With that, we'll have to modify some of the ramps, but it does score very high on Craig's list 
um, no, no pun intended, but, uh, <laughs> but, but it is a good project that we want to look at first for operations. The fiber network to Woodland Park is, is critical for um, notifying the public for alternate routes. If we do have to shut down the roadway, we want to communicate better to the public. So again, that will, that's a congestion reliever, if you will. So a lot of the operational elements that we're building into the system are really a first priority, if you will. So one other question, when it comes to congestion relief or um, long-term solutions, do you guys consider transit, regional transit types of, of uh, projects, or is it really just road projects? No, we look at transit as well. I mean, bus staying, uh, right. upgrading our park and rides. Uh, we're not happy, for example, with the Woodman Park and Ride, so we're looking at alternatives to improve ingress and egress off I-25 for bus staying to make that more effective. Okay. Thank um, you. I, forgive me. I, I don't just I don't I don't know the history of all. Oh, of this, sure, so. sure. So no, it 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 certainly is something we want to look at transit, uh, uh, not only ridership but uh, bicycle and pedestrian, uh, you know, infrastructure. We build that into our projects as well. And, and Rob, from your perspective as the executive director of PPACG, what is what is your view on all of this? And as far as congestion versus, I mean, you are the voice of, of PPACG, and I guess I want to know as your board member, what what voice do you have on these issues? Um, yeah, I usually follow the voice of the board, but I think uh, we, whoever's got the mouse, thank you for pulling up. Uh, you can see the top ranked project, mm -hmm. Nature Lanes on I-25. So that's cleared environmentally. It just needs a mere 84 million dollars. Uh, for CDOT to implement the HOV lane, which would be bus rapid transit or uh, the HOV, all the uses of an HOV lane. So it's been integrated into our list of projects, that 161, I think, is the, the number. So if you look at that list, you'll see transit projects, HOV lanes, you'll see capacity, safety. Uh, we run the gamut of all the improvements. So as the board uh, does the final approval in November, uh, we just approved the, the transit and specialized transit plan that's embedded in this as well. And Good so I think across the board, it's all modes, all types. Uh, the tough job for you and the rest of the board members will be like, well, what's that top tier? If you look at the second to last page in your packet uh, for this item, you can see HOV lanes comes in number one from a certain criteria. Has the board adopted that yet? No. But we're going to ask you, look at the multimodal, look at the safety, look at the maintenance, look at operations. What is going to be your three to five hundred million dollars of priority? Our our hesitation is we don't know the funding source. We don't know if the feds come down with a new safety funding grant that we can all apply for. Then this board will be, okay, what's your top hundred million dollars of safety? And so whether CDOT comes with a, a list of questions or a funding source from an unknown source now, what are those projects? So I think we have the menu for the long-range plan, which you've all looked at this list many times. So what is it on that list that you really want to go after? Uh, some lend themselves for certain categories, others for uh, other ones. So that, that's where we're at now, and I, I think uh, as we develop the list, we hope to knock it off again. I mean, the, the last list didn't take too long, you know, thanks to CDOT and work of the board members and the feds and all our regional partners. I, I think $300 million came uh, pretty quickly. So I think uh, kudos for the board and all our partners. Thank you. Dr. Null? Um, I would just, with a historical perspective, once again, point out there was a time that uh, we didn't know uh, what was happening on our roads unless we uh, drove up there. And this particular organization and the representation of the state uh, and local people started uh, almost a process that all, at every meeting just about we were watching what happened to roads locally and as far as Cripple Creek and other places. And uh, it, it, I, I would attribute it with, to the improvement of that through the public participation process that started in this council quite a few years ago, and some of you were here. I'm not the only chronologically gifted person, am I? Uh, Just the most chronological. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> but we remember how we used to see, and then they put the signs up, we'd go see them. And so it really started with citizens 
uh, getting a chance to review what was happening on the roads, and it, it decreased a lot of the anger because people didn't understand, and it's been a good history since then, in my opinion. Thank you. Just uh, one part is the waiting, balancing the safety versus maintenance for multimodal. That's part of the waiting, and the CAC is going through that right now. Um, the second thing is um, the single most requested project we get is actually rail transit from here to Denver. Amen. The issue with that, and see that did a study, is in order for it to be competitive with the highway, the tra it has to be as fast as cars are going to be. The rail line, uh, the tracks aren't set up for that, so it requires complete reconstruction in order to do that. So it ends up being a multi-billion, from here to Denver is a, I think, three or four billion dollar construction project. See that's entire budget in a year is, I think, a billion. Six. Yeah, 1.6 billion. So, just that project is multi multiple years. That would require a statewide vote of funding. On a smaller scale, within Colorado Springs uh, urban area, BRT, BRT is something we're looking at. But that requires some concurrent land use changes to to get the the density that will really, really support that. So, those two would need to go forward together. So, and yet Utah and New Mexico have both found ways to put trains in. Yep. It doesn't so. seem like too big of a challenge for Colorado. You have to start somewhere. Yeah, please. Tyler. Well, and to that end, as the representative for the Impact Coalition, this is a, a vital document for us to put together and come up with our regional priorities. We have been successful um, and really at the thought of the Impact Coalition, what do we really want to be advocating for? So the next, as we travel to uh, Washington, D.C. at the end of this month, being able to carry forward a, if you will, draft list of projects or even the cost-benefit um, analysis so that we can be advocating for some ideas, some projects, and get the word out there as to what the Pikes Peak area is looking for in terms of its future and what that future will look like, what the multiple aspects will look like, what the congestion will look like, so we can start preparing for a strong request in some way or another. And I think now is the time to be laying the groundwork while we have good um, representation in Washington and trying to introduce some of these ideas because while we have a multi-billion dollar idea and we don't have the money, we may be able to secure some of that funding for our region if we do have those prioritized projects so we can carry forward. In, in that vein, uh, Tyler, um, after you guys go to Washington, how often are we getting updates from our lobbyists? Uh, and you probably get them more often as the committee, but yeah. I'm not recalling the last time this board got briefed on how our dollars are being effective in and Washington. It's probably uh, my neglect in, in updating the board as a representative there. Um, I was uh, hoping that they would be providing minutes or notes to pass <laughs> along, but it's much more conversational as that okay. how that's moving forward. Um, as we do get information <coughs> forth, I will try to pass that forward, but um, I am attending at least twice a month. Um, and our lobbyist was here last week, two weeks ago, I think, and we had a big, long meeting, um, or many meetings, about to really get some productive work done and, and forward our priorities as a region. Yeah, I, I know we're just a, you know, a one tenth of the budget there, but that's, we've been doing that five years now. Absolutely. And uh, I haven't seen any requests for any cost increases or anything. I'm wondering if our 100K is going as far now as it was when we started, or. Well, there's been other partners that have joined. So okay. That's okay. Okay. Well. Um, and the other piece of that is this is a direct request from them to what are how can we best help PPACG? Sure. You know, whether it's transportation or aging or any of these things, how can we best leverage these relationships that we have in Washington and, and effectively uh, lobby for our interests. So Good. Uh, uh, this is, I think, one of the big tools that we can use is to have a resolution approved by this board and say, you know, as we have, what, four or five times in the past, here's our bulleted prioritization. And gosh, you know, you take this and then third bullet down, it really sparks an interest among someone and says, gosh, this is a perfect example for a grant opportunity or this particular program, then we can advance that move. Great. Well, thank you for that. Okay. And good luck. Uh, next week, is it? Two weeks. Two weeks. Two weeks. Three yeah. weeks. Yeah, for, for those on the <coughs> trip and the transportation group, you're going to see item 7B as your talking points. I think the, the list of projects is, is what we have for now until the board says, you know, here's a different one. Yep. But, you know, I, I don't think uh, they're going to give us the billion dollars in two weeks. So I think the board has time to. Maybe three. 
three weeks. <laughs> so, Mark Andrews, you mentioned ramp metering. That's just those little signals on a ramp that yeah. right. that go red and green to right. and kind they, of control the access. Right. No. So, so we're going to get some ITS funding. Uh, it's not enough to do everything we want. So we're looking at reaching out in the future with our cash management to try to pull in some some other funds to be able to get that ramp metering study going. Okay. And the results of that could be, um, well, well, we know Garden of the Gods, for example, might be a very good candidate for ramp metering. But again, we're seeing that the first step is to improve that travel time reliability. We need to be able to get the ramp metering in, and I think we'll, we'll see better flows on I-25 through town. Um, again, that's the first step. Then the HOV lanes would come later after that. So we'd like to get that, that project um, to, to, to construction fairly soon to see some benefits. Yeah, I, I wonder about HOV. Every time I go up on 36, they're closed. I mean, are they ever open? I think they see good, it coming. Good, good question. <laughs> yeah, they, they may see it coming. Um, you know, that the environmental document does suggest uh, um, HOV lanes is the lanes 7 and 8 for mm -hmm. the future widening. Okay. Uh, it, it, is, it is something that's been looked at. Um, uh, I still wonder if that is a good decision, but, you know, I think time will tell. I think that project is is quite a few years out if we can be effective with the operations first um, because I, th I think there are good benefits to ramp metering that we're at that stage where we get six lanes it only makes sense to go to that system and I think we'll see the benefits for for quite a while on that. So I shouldn't get rid of my inflatable travel dummy yet, huh? I wouldn't, I wouldn't <laughs> go there yet. Okay. Okay. Tyler and then Andy, Just to follow up on ramp metering, um, if you could educate me a little bit, the concern I'd have is, that, for example, on Garden of the Gods, wouldn't you just be you'd be helping the CDOT facility, but then potentially creating huge congestion along the city facility? Oh, on Garden yeah. Of the Gods? There's, there's, that that's part of the study to look at. What are the impacts on side roads? How does does that affect? Uh, is there additional infrastructure that we need to put in? Additional capacity on the ramps, for example. Yeah, it's it's not just simply uh, put in a ramp meter and it's going to work. So yeah, you've got to look at the system, uh, including those intersections, and and make adjustments if necessary. Yep. A few years back, when I was uh, had a couple of kids up in Fort Collins, I'd, I'd go up there and I'd hit the uh, the HOV lane, you know, a fair number of times, um, but. It was quite enlightening to, you know, rip along there in the HOV lane and look over there and I feel like I'm standing still. So they were. <laughs> <laughs> and good point. I'll get one additional point related to the HOV. It's the number one ranked project and, and benefit cost looks great. All the analysis was done in 2040. Actually, we don't have a need for the HOV lanes right now, whereas there are other projects, and I'll, I'll pick on the Powers Research Interchange. We have the need for it now. And so that that the timing of the need is it will probably uh, be some more information that will um, be used in developing the list. So I have one final question for you, Craig. Earlier in one of your reports, you mentioned uh, construction costs in Colorado are forty-seven percent from two thousand ten to twenty fourteen. Uh, forty-seven percent increase statewide in Colorado construction index, and it may there's pockets higher and lower. Um, we're hoping that with the uh, um, drop in price of oil per barrel and some of the other things that we'll start seeing next year and the next year some at least flatlining. Well, granted, 2010 was a pretty lean year, miserable year, but that's just an incredible number. I mean, 50% increase in, in just that short period of time? Yeah, and that, that's a natural segue into the next item, too. Uh, when we did the 2016 to 2019 tip, uh, we, instead of doing a call for projects, we, the big PPACG, uh, sprinkled the money, 2019 money, back to projects to cover for that. Uh, not all projects got, got funding in that scenario. So uh, item 7C is uh, we have received from our uh, local entities three or four local entities, about half a dozen projects that need additional funding in order to go forward. Uh, we think we have enough money 
in the existing with reconciliation and some other adjustments to cover all those projects. But we'll um, do that, take that back to the committees this month, and hopefully next month you'll see a TIP amendment to uh, get those projects fully funded. Because some of them, you know, Manitou Springs is one of them. The bridge is there a million dollars short because of the costing was done in 2010 or 11, and it's just can't keep up. So, and so that that's the plan then is to take 2019 funds. Well, and we have actually have in uh, 17, 18, and 19 we have some funding, and so we'll take those funds and, and drop it into projects. So it may require moving projects forward and backward in time unless CDOT can get us the cash management uh, approval. Which we'll see, um, uh, but then we'll end up maybe adjusting projects in what year they happen. But they'll also get the full funding. So, so look for that amendment next month. So we are on item seven C since we just kind of seamlessly segued Segway. into yes, that. that. Yep. Um, nope. And then, and, and just briefly, how does that uh, impact or interface with our NOPE policy? Um, the projects when we the NOPE policy originated because we we use benefit cost analysis in selecting projects and. It appeared that there were some projects that um, manipulation of the cost of projects to get a good score and then coming back later under contracting saying, oh, I missed it by a million dollars. And so to avoid that, uh, what the policy is is just, okay, so give your best estimate of cost. Anything that goes beyond that is the responsibility of local entities. When we did that policy, we were not expecting a 47% increase in four years in funding. That's just, it's crazy. Um, so that it. What it requires is the board to review the projects and say, yep, that's a good reason to uh, have cost, uh, cost overruns, and here's the funding. And I would say a statewide, it's not, it's not local, it's a statewide construction index, and 47% mm -hmm. in 10 years, or in four years, is pretty harsh. Well, I so. mean, this is an area where you, you don't really have any choices. Right. You know, so. if your inflation hits and you, you can buy it lesser value car or you know whatever but on these projects you can't you can't build 80 percent of a ramp nope. you know what i mean so well you can it just, and it makes for exciting well, yeah. driving <laughs> <laughs> Please. just one quick cool question on that 47 percent is that road construction index yes. or is that all construction that's colorado road construction in colorado road. that's roads and bridges roads and bridges thanks yep. mm. but it's up significantly like somebody's making all money. construction all the projects are up. Uh, building projects are up too. We well, yeah, you expect some of that, especially coming out of an economic downturn like we did, but not to that degree. It just seems and it's furious in some way. And some of it is like steel is an international market now, and China and concrete also. And China has been buying up uh, concrete and steel on the national market and paying just more for it, and it it's been crunching the whole the whole world. So. Yeah, mm -hmm. it'll slow down now. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, but we'll, we'll, if and when will we see the effects of that slowdown or the lower price of oil? A year or two. Yeah, so. Any other questions? Anything for Craig? Nope. Thank you very much. I think so. Thank you. Finally, uh, item 7D is the Statewide Transportation Advisory Committee agenda. Yeah, I'll just give you a couple updates on prog uh, programs that work for a while and then new two initiatives at uh, CDOT. One is. Um, Pike, uh, the peak period shoulder lanes uh, is now will, will be in effect later this month on uh, the east uh, I-70 eastbound. So, for the ski season coming up, you'd expect that peak period shoulder lane to be in operation, uh, and it is apparently for recreational traffic only. But you'll see that operational very soon. Uh, and then, secondly, uh, the C-470, the broad around the south part of Denver, um, congestion-based tolling will be in effect. So, the higher the congestion the higher the toll. Those tolls will vary between $5 and $30, depending on the congestion on C-470. So that should take effect on uh, September 21st, to understand. Hmm. Yep, yep, so be prepared. They're very urging people to buy the transponders, the, the barcodes uh, for your car. Uh, the difference between a barcode and not barcode is about double. So make your plans now if you're planning on driving in the Denver metro area. Well, yes? How do people know what the cost is going to be before they're on it? I mean, if you get on it, you're expecting to pay seven, and you get to the end, and it's thirty. Yeah, you know, I, you know, I, I don't know what that mechanism is. Um, they put I, you to work in the toll booth. Well, it, it is. You don't have. It. You don't have. <laughs> right. And so, if you have an have a E470 barcode, it's the same code you'll use on the C470. Right. 
but assuming those of us will be exactly. go to Denver twice a year to the airport, you know, I mean, it's good. Yeah, yeah, you know, that's a good question. I, I don't know, Sharon, what, what that process is. Uh, Mark, I don't know if anybody from CDOT would know. But, uh, Randy, did you catch that at the so, well, I, yeah, I didn't catch that they answered that particular question on that, yeah. but I just know from elsewhere that there was a, when I was in California, they had something like that, variable changes, mm -hmm. and you could watch as you, you know, they actually posted it on the overhead yeah. signs, yeah. and as you're driving along, you could see the price change. Okay. Mark, which, you know? which was, yeah, uh, Mr. Pico is exactly correct. <laughs> Oh, no, I'm only at <laughs> when you're leaving Fountain to head to Denver, you need to know it so you can leave three hours earlier if you don't want to pay thirty bucks. You know. So oh, I, I agree, but uh, it, right. it, it was it was one of those you know eye-opening experiences to watch the prices change as you drove along the, you the interstate. For that was, in business, when people advertise one price, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, well, and, and, of course, remember <laughs> if you don't pay any toll, you can remain in the non-toll you know, lane. Toll lane, yeah. So, okay. Just, well, just yeah. plan to take more time. Now, this gentleman well, jumped up with the opportunity. Michael, he, I think he has uh, all the answers. You all, have, for the most part, answered all the questions. But Michael <laughs> Snow with CDOT uh, Transportation Development. Yeah, the, you get informational signs as you enter. So you have the decision point and time while you're driving to decide whether you'll use those lanes. I don't know if there's also uh, posting, like, ways to find out if you're leaving Colorado Springs. What is it looking like when I get to Denver? Do I want to use the toll or not? Uh, of course, you have to also understand that they change readily based on the volume of traffic. So you could leave Denver, you could leave Colorado Springs and have it be one rate. By the time you're there, congestion can build, and they will adjust as it builds through the hour. You're not going to enter it thinking I'm paying seven dollars and get to the end and no, okay, <laughs> no. <laughs> it's very large. They're very large informational signs that you can see very clearly, and it usually says, uh, you know, from this from this location to this location, the toll is this amount, and from this location to this amount, you know, as you go through it, so you can even exit and enter it. Um, you'll see that if you have a chance to drive US 36, you see that uh, evidence very well. Yeah. Yeah. And then the third, real quick update: the uh, I-70 East, the, okay. uh, the uh, parcel covered lower. Section will, is, is on schedule. We expect to begin building that project next yeah. spring, I believe. It's a $1.17 billion project uh, for I-70 eastbound. So that's, uh, that's so been environmentally cleared and ready to go? No, not yet. I understand we're still... Budget, right, Norm? Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. No, I, I think we're still waiting on environmental. I don't know how far out we are, but Rob? Yeah. I think uh, it's a couple months for environmental clearance. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we have hundreds of millions of dollars of projects cleared and ready to go down here. Ready to go. But CDOT's already funded a project that hasn't been even cleared yet. Is that a correct statement? I think that is. That's probably accurate. Yep. And isn't that budget? Isn't that budget for that project about the same as the budget for CDOT for the year? Uh, One point six billion total for the CDOT for all all projects, all all funds. All right. Right. Pardon me? 1.2 on that one? 1.17 is the current number. Yep. Mark, yep. Let, let me ask you, have you seen an increase in traffic over Hoosier Pass? Oh, my God. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> that, that answers that. that that's, that's one of the gems of living in the Pikes Peak region. We don't have to deal with all that mess. We can slide up right over Hoosier and get where you're going. Shut up there. And I'm yeah. seeing eight out of ten cars now taking a left on 285 heading back into Denver. I'm thinking there may be a... a Aspect to the marijuana that we didn't uh, plan for. Uh, and I think people that are on marijuana drive more slowly. <laughs> and, and I think you're going to see a, a congesting. And it's a fact that they drive more slowly, and it's it's going to cause congestion all around the state. And, and I, you know, my last few trips over Hoosier Pass, I, I, you know, been eyeballing up there to that car that's going so slow and just. Yeah. Wondering, you know, it, it, I, I think it may save lives. I don't know. But. Well, they used to be pills, so, you know. I mean, but you were on your bicycle, and they were in the car. <laughs> and I, yeah, I was passing them, which is weird. Thing. All right. Oh, two new, two, new, uh, two new initiatives that CDOT's working on. One is called Traffic Incident Management Coalition. Uh, think NASCAR road crew for this, and uh, how coalitions of both uh, government employees, CDOT, and commercial vendors would respond to an incident on the highway. Coalitions of groups would respond very quickly to get that traffic cleared. So that uh, initiative will be moving from Denver down into Colorado Springs area here soon. They'll be looking for partners to develop for specific coalitions. So 
That's uh, through the Traffic, Traffic Systems Management Office, T TISMO. They'll be looking for candidates, so expect for us to contact. Um, and uh, for the Cosmics project, we actually had that here during the con Cosmics construction, and it worked wonderfully. Yeah. Just the funding wasn't there to continue it past uh, the Cosmics construction project. It, it, it is a very so we can expect program. that to shift in a new emphasis down here in Colorado Springs. Yep. And then finally, a new program called Road X. Road X. It's a it's a, a project to look at how technology can be used to manage traffic. Uh, technology such as platooning heavy cargo truck tra trucks traveling at highway speeds six to twelve inches apart connected electronically, so the lead vehicle breaks, all vehicles break. Um, so technology like that. Virtual guardrail, so no steel but electronic guardrail so that when you're driving in your high-end car you get the little warning signal electronically from a guardrail that's not physically present but electronically warning you of a, of a shoulder that's nearing. So technology like that, uh, there's a group called the InnoVisors Council to look for ideas for how technology can be used to improve traffic in the state. <coughs> so that will be opening up uh, next spring. Thank so, you. Yep. Yeah. Thanks. My comment at, 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 the meet, at the meeting up there was, uh, one, that's terrifying. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the, the idea of uh, platooning 18-wheelers uh, and electronic guardrail to keep them on track. Um, you know, I, yeah, that's a terrifying thought. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, but, but, the other, but the point I made with them is that they really need to have their security for a system like that really, really well locked down. Um, that, I mean, that's one of those things. If you have a bad actor in there who wants to create havoc, boy, that is that is a way to do it. Uh, so that, there, there's a lot of issues yet to be worked out on something like that. And they acknowledge that that's an area of concern. I just hope the electronic guardrails work better than my neighbor's electronic dog fence. <laughs> Same concept. Same concept. Same concept. Uh, yeah. 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 I'm, I'm kind of fascinated. I, I, I'm not quite sure. If you want to put the electronic guardrails and the, the speeding platooning trucks along with the pot smokers, <laughs> figure out what that does. It's just kind of an extraordinary discussion that we're having. <laughs> that's where I ever imagined. Yeah. Stay tuned. Uh, so, I'm, I'm trying to sit here and really understand the variable rates um, yeah. and understand the intention behind that. Um, is, you know, is it to try to deter traffic from I – mean, I'm not going to pay 30 bucks. I don't know how long of a span, but you've got to be kidding me. Um, or to take advantage of – I mean, what is the intention? How does that control – we talk about a lot I, I think the uh, idea is to provide an economic incentive to move from congestion to non-congestion non periods, right? So, uh, but of course, it will be a revenue source as well. I mean, is as we, what we want to do though with our highway system is use financial deterrence. Just, <laughs> I mean, that's a policy question. I mean, <laughs> I mean, as policymaker you yourself, you know that those yeah. questions come all the time. So that that's a policy decision. Okay that the uh, uh, Transportation Commissioners and CDOT has, has made. So. Yeah. It just seems kind of counterintuitive to say what you're saying because we built these lanes, encouraged people to use them. If you're willing to pay a little bit extra, you get better, but now we're going to, you're used to using it, we're going to sock it to you. It just, I, I don't like the idea of, yeah. Well, and, that, and that becomes the airport issue because you can't control when your flight leaves. And, and what about, I mean, I, I, obviously, I know you've gone oh, through all of this, but when Here comes the pro. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is one of the answers to it. Yeah. Yeah. Springs is going to do it. But you might choose a different flight, sure. Not rather than, not, you know. Well, I'd love to fly out of Colorado Springs. That would be my first pro. Well, that's another policy choice. <laughs> I, I, I'd encourage that, by the way. I got $30 on a toll Hello, Good afternoon. Morning. Um, Kath Kathleen Crager, Transportation Manager for Colorado Springs. I just felt the need to add a little explanation on the variable HOV hot lanes. And we have had variable rates in Denver for quite a few years on the HOV hot lanes. Um, what the real goal of them is that HOV is free. And currently we're defining two passengers in a car. As, as a high occupancy vehicle. And to be truthful, there aren't that many two passenger vehicles 
on I-25 in Colorado Springs. There's a few more in Denver, but even in Denver, there aren't that many HOV vehicles. Um, and when the lane first opened up, it was HOV only, and it was basically unused. It later came as a hot lane where you could pay a toll to use it, um, but you were paying for the luxury of driving by yourself in what was reserved as a faster lane for high occupancy vehicles. So if you are still willing to carpool, or even just take your husband along, or wife, then you get to use the lane for free. But if you're driving by yourself, there is an increasing rate at it. And one of the things I find as a driver in Denver quite often that you'll do is, as Councilman Pico was saying, you get into the HOV lane and it goes slower than the other lanes. You have a tendency to look at the rate. And if the HOV lane is going for um, 35 cents, somewhere really low, you don't get in it because it's probably going slower than regular I-25. But when it's up to $5, that type of thing, that's when you want to get in that lane because you're going to go much faster than the other lanes of traffic are going to go. So it is paying for the time savings and it's paying for the luxury of doing it by yourself. Did that help at all? Yeah. In a similar uh, thing, the other economic side of it is it's the congestion issue is not 24-7. It is during peak periods. And so That's it's right. trying to distribute that use over a greater period of time. So if Sharon's trying to go to the airport, she might consider leaving three or four hours earlier, getting up to the you know, east side of Denver and finding something to do in the meantime or you know, something else to avoid that congestion period. And what Craig was saying about we're not ready for HOV lanes in Colorado Springs probably quite yet, our peak period is still typically under an hour. In Denver, it is typically three hours long. Um, so there's where you get the need for things like HOV lanes. I think that both the city and CDOT and probably PPACG agree that um, it's much more likely you, you need to do ramp metering on the freeway bef long before you do the HOV lanes, that that's sort of our first step at um, providing some traffic control on freeways. It's, obviously, it's, whether it's electric power or traffic, we don't build for peak. We just can't afford to build for peak. We build. Right. So we want to distribute the peak to the, you know, to, to share those costs over over the day, course of the day. So we'll get all this figured out, and then some current seven-year-old is going to invent the low-cost personal hovercraft, and then they're going to all be irrelevant. <laughs> start managing lanes in the sky, I guess. Or we can telecommute. <laughs> Go broadband. <laughs> Any other any questions or comments for our esteemed state stack representatives? Any? Oh, please come on up. Some meals. Thank you. Um, my comment really was something that was brought up earlier, and um, I just want to make a point. My name's Sue Meals from Up the Pass, um, division leader. And what I've done is encourage a lot of our citizens to get involved with their government, either way, whatever their thoughts are. And um, you've mentioned before about, first of all, I think CDOT has done a really good job in helping us with post-fire flood and um, doing a good account of the finance end of it and, and doing a good job with our, our money. Um, someone had mentioned about congestion and uh, some others were taking great pride about getting citizens involved and input. I thank you for that. But I want you to understand, too, something, the frustration of the citizens to figure out which meeting to go to, how to say it, and so forth. Um, many of our citizens today are going through Parks Department to comment about trails. I guess you term it non-motorized parts for transportation. And there is a frustration. Um, uh, a couple years ago, I had at least 27 of them go down and testify, either pro, con, whatever, and it seemed like they were just dismissed, lost in the shuffle. Um, so I would just like to give you kind of a, for your information, they're trying to figure out what, when, where, and how to say. Um, they're not rebel rousers. They are not against trails. Um, they're citizens who've lived there, retired military, retired engineers, retired ge geologists, Teachers, attorneys, you know, the whole works. Um, and they have walked those trails 
for years and years and years themselves. Um, anyway, they have some very good solutions that are being ignored. And I, you know, I struggle in trying to advise them. Well, I see in the minutes that uh, Susan Davies had contacted three or four of the committees through Pikes Peak Area Council governments. You know, which committee do we go to and at what point do they testify? Thank you. Thank you for coming up. That's a, a really good point. Uh, we struggle sometimes to keep up with all the acronyms and committees, so I can imagine it's even more challenging for somebody who doesn't get to regularly attend these meetings. And, and jurisdictional boundaries. And That's confusing. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, any member entity announcements today? Anything going on? Just want to extend my thanks again to CDOT. We had a project at the intersection of Color 67 and US 24. The runaway project uh, was completed a day before the, the large veterans rally. We had mm -hmm. six to 10,000 motorists traveling on that road that day, and uh, CDOT did a great job getting it all done, right away finished, signage in place. So thanks again, Mark, for your support and uh, uh, keeping our motorists in mind. That was a wonderful event, by the way. Oh, good. There, there. Yeah, I was it was Woodland uh, Park, so all those custom vehicles, yeah. I don't know you really call them a motorcycle, some of them are, you know, look like <laughs> pulling a Volkswagen bug behind it or yeah. something, but it was, uh, it was really impressive. Please. Okay, I'll be leaving Friday for the uh, Smart Cities Council in Washington, D.C. It's an international council whose uh, sole purpose is to use data to uh, improve our, our facilities, whether it be electrical grids or cars, transportation, multimodal. Uh, it's best practices, lessons learned. If you have the opportunity, if you'll just look up Smart Cities Council online, uh, you'll find that it has something for everybody. It has quite a repository of, uh, again, lessons learned and, and specific information that you'd be quite surprised about. Again, it's, it's specifically uh, about the use of data. Uh, IBM is a big contributor to it. As a matter of fact, each one of these uh, meetings, they offer a $500,000 free scholarship to bring Watson into a city and plug in Watson to see what they, they can generate as far as uh, cost savings and, and, and good ideas. That's all next week. Thank you. Good, good luck with that. Hopefully you get some good information. I bring a lot of information back, I guarantee. They actually sponsored me. They were so shocked that somebody was coming out of Colorado. <laughs> Uh, but they're, they're paying my way, so it's a great opportunity. Any other? Please, Sharon. Yeah, Fountain has two events. One is next Tuesday. We're having a community night at the park. We're going to bring out all the big equipment and let the kids climb all over it, get in the buckets and all sorts of stuff. And, you know, we did it last year, and it was a really fun thing. So that's from 4 to 7 at Metcalf Park. If anybody has young kids that might be interested and you probably got some big kids climb on it too if you really want to. But uh, I think that'll be fun. It's free and there's free hot dogs and free uh, drinks. So that'll be fun. And then on the 26th, the Friends of the Fountain Fairview Cemetery are having a reenactment. And it is veteran based. All the reenactors are going to do uh, veterans. And so that is from 10 to 2. And um, from 1 to 2, it is free for veterans and their families. Uh, tickets are $10 for adults otherwise. So um, I think that'll be a really fun event. So. Thank you. Are there any other member entity announcements? Well, our next meeting will be October 14th. And if there's no further business, we are adjourned. Enjoy your lunch. How are we? Um, Rob, what the 9 11 thing? I don't think we got invited to that. Oh, you yeah. How are you doing? Huh? Anybody yeah. ever hear from former mayor Shirley? He has dropped I, um, off the face of the earth. Yeah. yeah, I don't. I didn't see it come through my stuff. Sometimes if they send it just to the mayor.